Let's get started and I'll walk you through what it is that we are doing. I apologize if it was appearing to be a little bit confusing around uh, uh, what we are asking you to do. Okay, my name is Vijay Saraswat. Thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be here to tell you about some work that uh, uh, my colleagues and I have been doing over an extended period of time now, almost 15 years now. Um, so uh, this was uh, work that we started at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center back in early 2014. Uh, I was at TJ Watson till late last year. Now I'm at Goldman Sachs actually working on something very different going back to some of my earliest work in AI and natural language understanding. So this is a very refreshing return to me, uh, this opportunity to give you a talk about X10, return to me to work that I spent and my colleagues and I spent a lot of our intellectual uh, capital on. So X10 is a programming language uh, which um, we worked on, as I said, for an extended period of time. And it started out uh, with a very simple goal in mind. Um, and actually, let me put up some slides here. I'm going to alternate between slides and writing on the board. Uh, and I will also have uh, extend running on my laptop, and I'll show you some examples as we, as we run through. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit interesting. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to reuse slides that Olivier Tardu, a colleague of mine, has used most recently uh, to give a multi-hour similar mini course uh, at, uh, um, in UK, uh, at the Supercomputing Center in UK. Uh, so we have been teaching courses on X10 in, uh, at various, uh, various settings, uh, supercomputing conference at other universities. I taught at Columbia for many years a course on uh, principles and practice of parallel programming using X10 with Professor Martha Kim. And so these slides that we have put together reflect the work that we have been doing over a significant period of time. You will find a copy of these slides on the X10 website. So x10-lang.org is your friend. There is a lot of material there about the language. In particular, uh, there's uh, stuff on tutorials, and this slide deck is right up on the top in the, in the section on tutorials. You will be able to download implementations of X10 um, on, uh, for your laptops. Um, X10 is meant, as I said very early on, to solve one problem. That problem is how do you program? How do you write single pieces of code that run on a very large number of cores, 50,000 cores. A very large number of cores, as you would need to do if you were writing code for a supercomputer. Now, of course, in 2004, that was the major driver. DARPA had just given IBM um, uh, $100 million to build out the next petaf the first petaflop machine. And as part of that, exercise as part of that uh, piece of work was the idea that hitherto people have been programming supercomputers using MPI, using OpenMP. CUDA had yet to be invented. So using a certain set of ideas whose roots lay in early work in the 90s around how to program these machines in an effective fashion. And the idea was that maybe the time has come to revisit uh, the underlying programming models and in particular uh, uh, construct new ones that are oriented at not just the supercomputer programmer, but much in the way that Java unleashed a whole wave of creativity in the mid to late 90s and became a dominant platform for enterprise level computing, the notion was perhaps we can do something similar now for large scale computing. So that was the genesis of this work. I'll return to that in a second. Uh, the point I want to make is that you can run X10 on your laptop which is not a supercomputer, not yet, and on very large machines, including very large clusters. And Boyana has been very kind to set things up on uh, a cluster here at University of Oregon, uh, 
and uh, uh, that is what we were walking you through was uh, the instructions on how you can get to that cluster your uh, accounts your id information and so on now uh, if you are from typical computer science backgrounds departments you may not really have how many of you have worked with slurm Oh, awesome. So more than I expected still. There are a lot of you who haven't. So typically when you have access to a very large cluster, you don't get exclusive access to that cluster for your code. You get to share that with a whole bunch of people. And you know, computing people have to, must have told you goes in cycles. So this is the cycle that refers to you've got a terminal or some mechanism for constructing your job and you submit your job. It's like a batch job that you're submitting to this large system. The advantage you get is that this large system can give you a tremendous number of cores on which to run your code for the duration of that job. Then that stuff is released and it goes back into the pool and other jobs can run. So you're working in a batch scheduling environment. You're not working interactively on that large system. Slurm is the thing that you use to submit such jobs and you get to specify all kinds of interesting information about, you know, the number of cores you need, the kinds of connectivity you need, the amount of memory, all those sorts of things when you submit your job. This course is primarily about uh, resilient X10. And so we're not going to be emphasizing as much the supercomputing aspects of uh, X10 as work that we started to do around 2010 or so. Uh, and in fact, it was spurred a bit by work on Spark, which you might think of as a kind of a competitor to X10 in so far as people started to use the ideas in Spark, which are fundamentally, excuse me, in, um, in Scala, which were fundamentally around functional programming and started to use them for concurrency. There was an ACA implementation that came out and then the Berkeley guys developed uh, Spark, uh, a programming model for resilient data structures. And so that was very much in the ballpark of where X10 was focused on high performance computing at scale. So we kicked off a project thanks to funding from the Air Force on resilient X10, which was intended to, make, to pursue the following research hypothesis. As you will see when we get to X10, uh, we felt we designed a pretty clean programming model for large scale concurrency and multi layer concurrency. Concurrency at the level of multiple nodes and concurrency at the level of a single node with a lot of uh, threads available on that node. So, um, so the question that resilient X10 sought to address is the question of, now you're running this program on all of these nodes, using up all of these cycles, what if one of those nodes goes down? So the notion in, in uh, uh, Spark of working with resilient data structures was to say, dudes, we are not going to give you a fully general programming language, we're going to give you one construct. That construct is quite useful. You can do a lot of things on top of it, but the advantage of working with that construct is that we will, uh, we will take care of things like a node failing in the middle of your computation. So we will get your computations to be resilient. We started out with the idea that we have now designed this wonderful, pro of course, wonderful programming language, and now we have to worry about resilience. Can we actually create a version of X10 that in fact understands failure of nodes and can recover from it in a way that the programmer is aware of what happened and can write compensating code. So this was, in some senses, there are a number, tomorrow I will go into what are at some level uh, the kind of research firsts for X10. What are those areas in which we feel that X10 set the benchmark as far as a certain set of research ideas are concerned? And resilience is one of them. So resilient X10 is a programming language. It's not a model like RDD. You can write your own different strategies, your own different data structures for maintaining resilience uh, while working on a large number of nodes. So the focus of this
uh, course, this mini course, these three lectures is going to be on the resilience aspect and less on the scale out and run things efficiently on a large number of nodes without writing MPI angle. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, what we are going to be doing. Um, the three lectures, the first lecture today is essentially about introduction to the core programming model. It's called the AP gas programming model uh, for an asynchronous partitioned global address space. Big mouthful, so everyone calls it AP gas. Uh, and this is the programming model that underlies the X10 programming language. You can think of X10's relationship to AP gas a little bit like uh, AP gas uh, is realized natively in X10. You could have an implementation of the AP gas programming model in Scala. In fact, we earlier, the group did release such a library or in Java. And in fact, uh, other research groups, the ideas here have had significant impact in the field. Other research groups like Vivek Sarkar's at Rice uh, went off and developed other C-oriented languages called Habanero uh, that uses essentially the AP gas programming model. Chapel, another programming language that came out of the DARPA funding in the early 2000s also has a lot of AP gas elements in its design. So a core focus for uh, the presentation here these three days is going to be this programming model and its realization in X10. So we built a whole programming language around this. And then the extension of this programming model to, uh, uh, to resilience. So the resilient version of AP gas. And uh, in any such enterprise, uh, remember this is a project that's gone on now for about 15 years. So there are more than 100 man years of work that has gone into this project. So in any such enterprise, there are many, many things that you've got to develop. So we've developed you know, a new type system as part of the language design. This is a constraint-based type system. We have papers on that in Oops Lab, what, 10 years ago. Uh, we've developed some variations on work stealing schedulers so on the implementation side, a lot of the work on the implementation side, some on the compilation, a lot on the language design. Uh, then a lot of new applications that showcase how this can be a better, a more easier to use programming model than MPI plus OpenMP plus X. That's the alternative that people talk about in the open source, in the, in the high performance computing community. So we have done that and then there has been some work on analysis of extend programs, particularly uh, trying to apply the polyhedral framework into the extend context. So there are a number about half a dozen research threads in which there's been significant contribution by uh, multiple research groups working on X10. And I will summarize that tomorrow. So today is the introduction to the core AP gas programming model and we'll work through a bunch of programs so you start to get a feeling for how you would write such, co such code. Tomorrow we will look at uh, some of these elements, um, these uh, disparate research elements that make up the Extend project. We'll look at some of them and in particular we will dive into um, an operational semantics, or so formal notion for what it means to run, execute, extend programs. And the reason I've chosen to do that is that resilience is a very slippery concept to get your hands wrapped around. And in fact, when we uh, embarked on this endeavor to do a resilient version of AP gas, the basic ideas were simply not clear to us. And we talked at length within the group about how we are going to do it and eventually realized for our own sanity, in order to avoid going around in circles on these complex issues, we needed to formalize what it is that we were talking about. So that led to a semantic, formal semantics for, as usual, it's a kind of an abstracted version of the language. Uh, um, um, a formal X10. Uh, it led to a semantics for formal X10 and then a semantics for what it means for places to fail. How does that show up in the programming model and what kinds of guarantees can be given for failed computations leading to uh, the so-called uh, happens before invariance principle that uh, uh, we will talk about a lot, the HBI. Uh, which is a very uh, succinct way of characterizing 
uh, what it is that the system, the runtime, is going to do even in the case of failure. What high level guarantees will the programmer get even if a node fails about the execution of these programs? Very importantly, X10 is an imperative language. And the reason for this is because a lot of the computations of interest to us, uh, particularly in the supercomputing space, are all about mutating shared state. They are about large arrays in which different sorts of computations have to mutate some elements here in, a, in one way, other elements there in another way, and have to repeatedly do this. There has been, to my knowledge, no uh, clear way of doing this large computation at scale uh, efficiently without having a notion of state built in at the heart of the programming system. Now, Guy is here, so you know maybe he has some things that I don't know about, he will tell us. But uh, indeed, as far as X10 was concerned, back in uh, 2004, we made the commitment that it is going to be built on top of an imperative programming model. And so that raises, as you understand, I think, uh, as far as concurrency is concerned, that raises all kinds of issues, including memory model issues that you have to deal with in order to give a coherent account of, uh, mutable, uh, uh, of mutable update at scale. Okay, so today is going to be uh, an introduction to Extend. Tomorrow we will touch these things and get in touch the broad uh, set of, uh, uh, set of research uh, um, directions that we have gone in uh, in Extend. And, um, and then we will go into the formal semantics, and then on the third day, we will talk about uh, resilience in more detail, and in particular, some of the implementation issues. It turns out that, of course, the hard part is not so much defining what needs to happen. That's a critical first step. But the hard part is actually getting an efficient implementation to handle uh, the situation when uh, nodes uh, start failing. So uh, particular, Olivier Tardou uh, took the lead in uh, designing the resilient implementation implementation of the runtime, and he and the team have done tremendous work to get uh, our overheads down pretty significantly uh, to the extent that even on those computations that uh, one might think that a Spark RDD implementation, uh, it's right in the wheelhouse of Spark, you know, it should do well. Uh, we show that with managed X10, uh, our, uh, that is X10 running on top of JVMs, uh, we are able to get a performance that is better than a Spark uh, performance performance for RDD, uh, you know, uh, friendly uh, uh, programs. Okay, so this is the overall game plan for these three days. Any quick questions at this point on this game plan before I dive into the details of the programming model? Yes, please. So I will deal with this more on the third day. The quick answer is that, again, uh, what I said earlier, there is an underlying data structure, RDDs, that Spark was originally built on. So its notion of resilience is focused around programs that use RDDs. The point about resilient extent is you can write any program in the extent programming model, in the APGAS model. And as you will see, it's a very rich model. It allows for recursive uh, spawning of uh, networks of activities across multiple places, going back and forth on the unbounded depth. So it's not just a so-called single program, multiple data. You start from the top, send stuff here, here, here. They keep running until they stop running, and then you are done. It's not that. You start stuff here, it goes there, it goes there, all over the place. And in particular, this has led to Another research direction, uh, which I will not have time to talk to talk about, it has is the direction of actually new programming idioms that arise because we surface up in the programming model this massive uh, asynchrony across many places. And in particular, this is the so-called uh, global load balancing model, the GLB model, which we've implemented as a library in X10 and written a number of other programs on top of GLB to handle uh, the execution of irregular computations on large, uh, large systems. So that sort of stuff 
Now you can ask what happens when a node fails in the middle of execution of that kind of stuff? And you will get an answer here. You can write resilient versions of that kind of code as well. So the underlying idioms that are available to a programmer who cares about long running computations that have to continue to run even when poor nodes fail, those underlying things are much richer in this context than they are in the Spark context. Any other questions at this point? Okay, so let's get going. Uh, here we are, um, and I will need to make this work in this kind of a way. All right. Okay, so the extend language is, um, uh, it is, um, it's very interesting. Um, so I am, uh, uh, Martin Odersky is a colleague of mine. We talked uh, actually a fair bit uh, when Scala was being designed. I was designing Xten at the same time. And I went and visited him. We had some postdocs together who worked on, uh, actually Lex uh, Spoon, who worked on uh, doing an initial version of X10 in Scala. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas between the Scala design and the X10 design. Ultimately, I decided that we are going to do our own compiler, mainly because at that point, only Martin understood that compiler and how to change it. And so we, we couldn't sort of develop our own programming model while relying on Martin to do our compiler for us. So we, uh, we went off in our own direction. And now, I think if we were to start again, we would probably start from a Scala base rather than uh, the Java base. The programming language, the syntax, we started with was uh, Xen has evolved a number of versions. I'm going to talk today about the current version that's 2.6.1. In the very early versions, it had a Java syntax. And then we quickly realized that for the kinds of computations that we needed to write, we cared about a much richer type system than Java's. So in fact, we developed this notion of a constrained type system. And then in order to express that type system, within an object-oriented, so we had committed to a Java-like object-oriented syntax. Um, so a class-centered uh, object-oriented syntax. So uh, in order to make that work within that commitment, we had to rejigger a few basic things, such as um, variables come before the type declaration. So variable colon type as in the functional languages. That sort of syntax is what we adopted and went all the way through. Uh, the language turns out a simple thing like that changes everything in the syntax of the language. So that's so our language ends up looking a little bit like Scala from a syntax point of view. It doesn't have, you know, Scala's uh, um, support for implicits, which I think is a really beautifully done portion of Scala. So it doesn't have that. That's a pretty complicated notion that uh, we ended up not incorporating into X10. Our focus is on scale programming uh, in the context where your code is going to run on many nodes. Each node may have many threads, physical threads available, and you want to write a single piece of code that runs on all of these resources instead of writing uh, the communication in MPI and the single node stuff in uh, OpenMP or CUDA. So that's the genesis of, you know, uh, of the APGAS programming model. And uh, the idea behind the APGAS programming model is actually fairly simple. And it's really interesting how this recent work we have been doing on resilience makes us go back and revisit the fundamentals of AP gas. But that is a topic I'll go into further uh, in the third lecture. So here's the point. You are going to run your uh, code, let us say, on 1,000 nodes, just to pick a number. Um, what kind of apps, and it's going to be imperative. So what kind of abstraction should be surface to the programmer who's going to write such code. Um, this problem has been around for a while. And the folks who initially worked on this introduced an idea of a distributed shared memory. So the DSM. And the idea was that, look, we're going to pretend that our heap exists in sort of a space over all of these 1,000 nodes. So any thread in any one of these nodes can read and write data structures in this shared heap regardless of where that data structure is actually located in these thousand, let me use the word, places. If it's local, great, you're going to operate locally. If it's remote, you're going to, under the hood, use a runtime system that sends messages off to that place, executes stuff there, and gets you back the results, and so on. Right? 
certainly sounds like a plausible thing to do. So people went down that path and did it. The big problem, of course, is that there are something like four or five orders of magnitude difference in latency and maybe bandwidth between what is available locally within a thread on chip in cache versus what is available across the network. That is way too much for a runtime system, an automatic runtime system to compensate for. So yes, you could write code in DSM, but you really had no guarantees about how your code was going to perform. And so without that performance, particularly the reason for going to large scale is because you need to run code on very large problem instances and you need to run it efficiently. So if you're going to work in a context where you need efficiency, but your basic abstraction is robbing you of that efficiency, well, that's not really going to work. So we realized back in 2004 that this is a central problem that we would have to tackle. Uh, it turns out, unbeknownst to me, when I designed this programming model, unbeknownst to me, there were, in fact, some people in the uh, high-performance programming community who had invented an abstraction called partitioned global address space. And so uh, we did something that was exactly like that, but with a twist. So let me quickly tell you what uh, the PGAS uh, model is like, and um, then we'll describe what this twist is. So the PGAS model says our heap is not a single flat heap. We are going to introduce a notion of a place. And so your program is going to run over, uh, what I mentioned earlier, a thousand nodes, a thousand places. Now, to fix your intuitions, think of a place as an operating system process. So you're going to run over a thousand processes. Each process has access to certain resources. In this case, memory. Um, out, you know, uh, backed by virtual memory out on, uh, out on a disk. It has threading, it has some computation available to you, and of course it has the ability to run your programs against that data. So this is, if you're thinking in terms of a Java-like setup, then this is an instance of a JVM uh, running on, so it's a JVM or a process running on uh, node one, and you may have, you know, running on many nodes. So, what we are going to do in the APGAS model is we surface this idea of places in the programming model. That's a big step we take. So you, the programmer, are no longer going to have the flexibility and freedom of simply saying, oh, I create an object, it's on my heap, I can read, write, I can do whatever I want. No, you have to worry about where is that object. So you have to worry about the places on which a program is running and where you create the objects in those places and where that mutable state lives. That immediately raises the question of how are you going to program against such a thing? Because ultimately you have to bring code together with the data on which that code has to operate. So that was the second major step we took, which was to say in a context like this, asynchrony is going to be critical. And this was a major point of departure from the PGAS world. So let me quickly describe how the PGAS world used to work like. And uh, this is, again, uh, the HPC folks uh, who, do things, um, uh, who do things on top of MPI and OpenMP used to follow this framework. So what it looks like is the so-called, what most code is written in looks like the so-called SPMD, or Single Program Multiple Data uh, Programming Model. Now what is this model? This is suited well for situations in which you are going to run very regular code. Essentially the same code, but on a vast amount of data. And let's say somehow that data is organized well in an array. So maybe two dimensional array, or uh, three dimensional, whatever. It doesn't matter that much the dimensionality of the array. To give you an example of what kinds of computations fit such a scheme, weather prediction is such a thing. Uh, in fact, uh, you look at this wall of a room. Uh, if you're trying to figure out heat transfer across the walls of a room, that's something that you can use partial differential equations to, uh, to uh, figure out exactly what is going on. You often end up implementing them using some sort of numerical relaxation that ultimately involves having a large array, uh, 
where you break up that whole uh, space into small cells. Each cell contains a value that's describing something like the heat flux that's going through that at a particular point in time in the simulation. And then you run it across many different time points in sequence one after the other. Uh, starting with some initial conditions, you end up with the final steady state distribution of uh, you know, temperature across that gradient. So uh, there, what you have is you write your code in one place. That code you distribute to all of these, sorry, you write your code, you write your code once. Uh, that code you distribute to all of these places. And then you kick it off synchronously. You send an instruction, you send a signal to all of these to start executing, they all start executing until the hammer introduced step called a barrier. And then the first one to hit the barrier stops. They all stop until everyone has reached that barrier. Typically, after everyone has reached that synchronous phase, there is some shuffling of data back and forth. Again, if you're going to look at a wall like this, uh, what, what I, so when you've got a wall like this, where are the places? Well, you're going to break it up into a regular grid, as I said. And then depending on the number of places, you've got 1,000 places. OK, you're going to break that up. 1,000 is bad. Let's say uh, 10,000. You're going to break it up into 100 times 100 grid. OK, so uh, now you get to choose as a programmer how you break up these elements across the 100 times 100 grid. Typically, you could put a square grid, a common square grid, uh, you know, uh, at the top left, and then you go around to the right, you go back down, you lay it all out. You tile it out across these 100 by 100 places. But when you do that, your physical boundary between two successive layers, if you're going horizontally across, then this layer and the next layer, sure, you've got a boundary. That's adjacent. But then you wrap around, and the guy below this, he might be many processors, many places away. So not only do you need to do local computation and then a global barrier to make sure that everyone has finished a local computation, but periodically you need to exchange boundary condition values. So that means this guy has to exchange values with the guy below, guy to its left, guy to its right, guy on top. And it can only do that when everyone has reached that whole point. So the SPMD model typically looks like local compute, barrier, shuffle, exchange of data, repeat, until a condition is reached when the error that you're looking for you know, from one iteration to the next is below a certain threshold, and then you stop. So the lovely thing about this is that this looks, smells very much like a sequential program, except that the massive amount of data forces you to make it work across many places. So for sure, you want to make such programs run quite, be, you want to be in a situation where your programming language is going to be able to express such programs in a very simple fashion and run them efficiently. And so you want to make sure that SPMD code runs in your APGAS programming model efficiently. But the big step we took was the recognition uh, back in 2004 that the more parallelism you bring into your system, you're going to run on 100,000 nodes, this kind of global synchrony, while very useful from a programming point of view, is going to be a big problem to implement efficiently. So we should start surfacing programmers the idea that in fact, your underlying systems are asynchronous, not synchronous. And you do that by surfacing a programming construct that focuses on asynchrony. So these are the two key ideas behind APGAS. One is the programmer has to deal with places, and the second, the programmer has to deal with asynchrony. OK. Um, then, of course, as uh, happens in any, by the way, so we face in any research project, particularly in programming languages, you always face this question, what am I doing? Am I designing a programming language for the whole world to use? Or am I designing a programming language as a vehicle to explore certain ideas with the hope that eventually, who was it who said that uh, uh, the language of the future is going to be Fortran? That's always Fortran. Whatever programming language you do, ultimately its success, measure of success is, did it influence Fortran? Right? So we essentially went down the path of saying, we are going to explore these ideas in as pure a fashion as we can, but we are going to develop them in a very real fashion. So these are languages that are available for use by real people to do real work. And that uh, sort of 
as you will see, it's a, we have had interesting, uh, interesting um, um, a payoff from that point of uh, from that point of view. Okay. Uh, in particular, where this led us here was another fundamental dilemma when you do high performance computing, which is, are you doing a native implementation? Or are you doing a managed implementation? Managed implementation is compiling out into JVMs, a managed runtime that gives you, a lot, that handles a lot of things like garbage collection, uh, threading support, and so on. And native is, you know, you got access to the raw machine. Of course, in the HPC world, everyone operates at the level of native stuff. But in the enterprise world, and we lived right in the middle at IBM of the enterprise world and the uh, HPC world. In the enterprise world, it's all uh, Java, which gives you all managed environments, which gives you a whole, uh, a big benefit. So we chose to go down both paths. This was a big, big commitment, and it had ripple effects throughout the language design, throughout the runtime design. Um, but eventually, we, and we've carried that through even till today. When you go there, you download, you will get, you have access to two versions of X10, a managed and uh, uh, a native. Um, more or less, all the features work on both, but there are certain features that work only in one and not the other. So that took us down the path of a compiler, runtime, standard library, an IDE. We spent a bunch of time developing an IDE and uh, used an open source, uh, and we made the commitment right day one, this is going to be an open source development because we realized that um, even with, uh, so you know, as I said, uh, hundreds of man years have gone into this project, a lot of of the time also has come from people who are not at IBM. So, and th that you can only make happen in the context of an open source project. So uh, this is what we are doing. Um, these are a whole bunch of links um, that uh, this has now become 260 and 261, mainly because of the resilience work. So website language spec, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, being very careful, uh, as, as Martin did with Scala as well, being very careful about, you don't have a language until you have a language uh, a manual. So being very careful about what we put in the language manual. So in any case, it's out there. Uh, please, uh, as you write code, if you want, if you worry about you know, what does a certain thing do, uh, the best place to go is to uh, read the manual first and then uh, look at the implementation, uh, try it out. Um, okay. So let's get to look at some code now. Um, well, I mentioned all of these things. Um, we are, uh, are designed for scale and so on. A few constructs, uh, type systems. Uh, yep, we mentioned this. Uh, you've got uh, command line compiler and launcher for uh, OS, for Linux, or Mac OS, and Windows as well. Uh, AIX, an IBM specific system. Uh, it runs Java v6 and up and Eclipse-based IDE, um, which uh, is, uh, if you are going to be using X10 and you are familiar with Eclipse, then this is worth using. It took, again, a long time to get to a place where an Eclipse IDE is actually useful because it forces significant constraints on your language implementation. It has to, the parser has to be incremental, the type checking has to be incremental in order for things to work reasonably uh, smoothly. So, not, so an implementation of a programming language like X10 is not just in the runtime, it's also in the compile time to get a good user experience, you have to uh, invest a lot in uh, getting the right underlying structures. Um, okay, so I have mentioned this as well uh, to you already that um, um, the uh, notion of running a program across multiple places uh, is sort of uh, familiar in the high performance computing world. Uh, there, um, before PGAS came along, the dominant way of doing these things was using MPI. How many of you have, are familiar with MPI? Used MPI for real code? Nice, very good. So MPI gives you a share nothing abstraction. You don't have a notion of a pointer from one memory, from one address space to another address space. You have a bunch of different address spaces and then mechanisms for sending messages back and forth, mechanisms for collecting these places into groups and performing uh, operations like uh, synchronization, like barriers across groups, the collective operations. Um, and as I said early on, uh, we made the 
decision that surfacing uh, fine-grained computations, and MPI lives at the SPFD view of the world. It doesn't have a notion of asynchronous computations that can, uh, you know, uh, hair around the entire collection of places. So we made an early decision to break from the MPI view of the world. The contrasting view for concurrency is in a single node, you've got a lot of threads running, and then OpenMP gives you a certain view of uh, executing a large number of tasks within these particular threads. And so people typically wrote in the high performance computing world two different kinds of programs MPI on top, OpenMP inside, and then more recently, last uh, five, 10 years, people have talked about MPI plus OpenMP plus X, where X is a CUDA like accelerator for, you know, doing certain kinds of uh, linear programming computations, uh, certain kinds of uh, numerical algebra computations uh, very efficiently. So instead, our goal was to give one programming model for all of these different uh, use cases. So I mentioned this already, the uh, clear distinction between local versus remote memory in PGAS. Here is a little bit of a clearer picture about how that looks. Uh, Program runs in many places. Each place has a local heap within which uh, data lives. Uh, when I say heap, it includes uh, portions of large arrays and objects as in a Java style object. Uh, and a bunch of activities that are operating on that local heap. We talk about logical parallelism here, so we do not uh, require that the programmer write code that is um, uh, precisely tied to the number of hardware threads available on that machine. Rather, there's a notion of logical parallelism, um, uh, as in many other high-level uh, parallel programming languages. And uh, then uh, the key uh, idea is to uh, surface these uh, constructs in a very simple and general way. And here, um, my background in programming languages is more from the theory side, uh, from the semantic side, and the notions of designing compositionality into your programming language. Few orthogonal constructs that work well together, that sort of motherhood within the communities for programming language design that I come from. And so we did that here. So the first obvious point is there needs to be asynchrony. How are you going to do that? Well, you've got statements in your language, so put an async before, and that means you're going to go spawn a thread logically to execute that statement. As simple as that, very simple, no clutter syntax, async s. This was before, C, remember 2004, 15 years ago, before C++ and other languages went down this async direction. And then the next step, is there a, is there a pointer or shall I just use a finger? Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, the next step was uh, to recognize the following. Look, fundamentally, we are based on shared memory. Now you're going to say, I'm going to give programmers the right to asynchronously spawn computation. What's going to happen? There's updates all over the place, but updates have to happen in some order. Where is that order going to come from given the disorder of async? And so that led us and again, this was actually before we realized that Guy and uh, Charles and others had worked on Silk. That led us to the notion that there's going to be a duel to async, and that's Finish. So Finish S, think of it like this. Uh, you are going to run this statement S. And when you run this statement S, that's going to be you know, sequential code as usual with some asyncs scattered in, it's going to be a whole tree of computations. Those asyncs may spawn further asyncs and so on. Finish as says, execute that entire collection of activities until they have all terminated, until they're finished. Only when, have they, when they have finished, do you go on and execute the next statement after finish as. Is that clear? Okay, yeah. No. That's a very important uh, decision we made early on. We are not reifying that thread. And the reason is because we are not guaranteeing to you that at runtime there is something like a thread that that async is connected to. Because we want to have the flexibility to have a lot of asyncs where at runtime there may be very few. So no, async does not surface an object on which you can call a method like a finish. Now, 
my friend uh, Doug Lee and company, same time they're working, Doug is working on the fork join library and we had a lot of interactions with, uh, with Doug around the design of all of these things. He had to go a different path, he didn't have a compiler. So you have to go the path of saying these are surface as data structures on which you perform things. So fortunately, a lot of these things are available in different ways now for people to program it. If you wish, you could write that code in X10. Nothing prevents you from doing it. But the underlying thing does not give you that object. This is another question. Okay, so that's async and finish. And in some level, that makes sense even in a single node. Okay. The nice thing that you get in X10 is then you get this. You get an at. So just at the same level as async and finish are about concurrency, at is about place distribution. So you're running code in a particular place. You can say at, at ps, and that says my current thread is going to stop executing. It's going to move state, and I'll tell you in a minute what that state is, to another place, p, and there it's going to execute that next statement, s. No restrictions on how these things are nested. I go to that other place, I execute some code, that could be an async. That could be a finish. That could be an act to another place. All of that recursive possibility is permitted by the language syntax, by the runtime, is designed to support such profligate use of uh, structure of you know, uh, code moving around from place to place, touching the data that it needs to at whichever place it is. So at p s will execute the statement s there. At p is synchronous in that you do not go on to execute the statement after at p s until s has executed. Of course, S may have asyncs inside. So S terminates even if those asyncs are still running. It's not a finish, okay? And you come back. If you want a finish, then of course you would write an at p finish S to ensure that all those activities have terminated before you move on to the next one, okay? Um, and uh, this is the expression version, which actually returns a value after doing it. And uh, uh, then you can continue with that value, which it turns out we do use that a fair bit. Now, let me quickly uh, address something here. Um, the question is, what is the state in S that you can, uh, uh, what are the references you can have in S? to state uh, outside that statement S. Now, we are all used to writing a nested block uh, code uh, where nesting matters a whole lot. And there's lexical nesting, so there's a variable declared out there, and there's a nested block within this block, I can refer to that variable. Very easy, convenient notion of using syntax to carry a lot of implicit references. Effectively, that supplies a context for the execution here. And that context is all the variables declared above us. But now I'm going off to this other place. Those variables are back here. Am I still allowed to access them? And the answer is yes, you don't have to do anything in the syntax to distinguish between a reference to a variable that is declared within S or a variable declared in an outer scope to S. That variable X, you refer to in exactly the same way. And you leave it up to the runtime to ensure how that access can be implemented efficiently. So in particular, the current runtime will actually, at compile time, get a handle on all the references that are in the scope uh, uh, surrounding this and gather, generate code which will gather that state and send it off to the other side to be operated upon there. But only a read-only copy of that state. If you need to mutate, the only way you can mutate an object is you have to go to the place where the object lives and then you can assign to that object. That brings us to how can you have a handle to an object that goes from place to place. That gets us to a global ref. So a global ref, uh, you can, so you know, it's a Java-like language, you create an object using whatever, new of some thing, and you get back a handle. You get back a reference to the object in your local heap. That reference you pass to a global ref, 
And now you will get back, and the square T is simply to say this is type generic. Um, so quickly, I'm not going to be able to get too much into x type system. Uh, x10 does have generic types, and we also split from Scala there in that the generics are not implemented by erasures. The generics, we actually reify types and we carry them around at runtime. Um, I won't get into this as usual with type systems. There's religious debates on both sides, which is the right thing to do. I will say this is, it gives you a lot of flexibility, but there is a runtime cost to doing what we did. So that says this is a global ref of type T. So what you get back is a handle, which is a global ref. And the only thing you can do to this global ref is you can ask, is this pointing to a local object? And if it is pointing to a local object, you can get that local object back. Otherwise, you try to get that local object back, and it's not local, you will get an error. So this is simply a way of wrapping things around so that you can send them around from place to place with the same bits. So the bits that go from place i to place j are the same as will go from place j to place k if they are referring to the same, the global reference to the same local object. So there's no mutation of those bits happening when you go from place to place. So that's an important part of the implementation of a global ref. And um, uh, this is um, the key idea behind which you build global data structures. Global data structures are data structures that uh, uh, when you're writing your code here at HPE, and you're going to go to that place, well, you need to be able to find a way to handle state at that place that you're going to. Well, you can do that if what is passed through is a global ref. So this is a fundamental part of the programming model, this ability to create global refs. Um, a place local handle is an interesting variation on this. And in fact, there are a few different dimensions of variability. And we haven't, you know, we've explored them conceptually, but we haven't implemented all the uh, boxes in this uh, matrix. So the notion here is that um, uh, a global handle gets you a reference that can be freely shared across all places. And that reference is always pointing to mutable state at one place, the one object. With a place local handle, you get a handle that you can freely share across all places. Same bits are going around everywhere. But when the place local handle was created, it was created in a context that for a given set of places, a local object was created at each place. And this place local handle is a reference to that collection of local objects, not just one of them. Now you send this place local handle to a place i, and you ask, is there an, a local object that corresponds to it? And just like the global ref, there's an operation that gives you that local object, if there is such a global local object, or you get nothing. So unlike the global ref, there isn't a single place, single object where all of these references point to. There are a collection of these objects. But there's a uniform way of dealing with them. And when you are at a place, you can only get your hands on the one that is there. Okay. Again, this is a building block that we arrived at after a lot of experimentation and work. And it is fairly robust. We use it extensively within our system. Uh, for the kind of array that I talked about before, I've got this large uh, whiteboard and I break it up into pieces. You would typically allocate that kind of a global array in chunks in each place. And you, and you would use a place local handle uh, where within the creation of the place local handle, you now spawn computation that goes to each of these places to create the local object. And then they're all knit together, bound together within this place local handle. Now you have a global array, and you can send computation all over the place to operate on that global array. Finally, and this was perhaps the least successful of our language designs, uh, elements of we face this issue of, you know, you're going to need to mutate in a single place uh, shared uh, locations with multiple activities trying to, uh, trying to update them. The ideas of uh, transactional memory were just coming to the surface at that point. We were not convinced that they were going to last. Uh, but nevertheless, from a concurrency point of view, the idea of uh, 
surfacing a simple abstraction instead of something like a lock, which is quite messy, uh, was very attractive to us. So we went ahead and we introduced uh, an atomic S, which says S is being executed, but at some level it's being executed as if in a single step with respect to everything else that's happening around it. It's being executed atomically. So none of the other activities, reads and writes, will intermingle with uh, the reads and writes of this activity that's within an atomic S. And you can imagine uh, that this, an atomic S, here there was a significant restriction that the body S in an atomic S could not have within it any occurrences of async, finish, or at. It had to be sequential code. That, of course, you can design a language, but that is not true. And then your runtime is going to have a lot of fun. Because uh, you now have to essentially, uh, the Barbara Liskov uh, did something like this in some of her early designs at MIT. You get these nested, abortable transactions, multiple places. It's a nightmare. It's not the sort of thing, nightmare from a performance point of view, not the sort of thing you want in a high performance computing language. So we didn't bite that monster. Uh, when is the conditional version of it? So uh, this goes back to Tony Hoare's notion of uh, uh, conditional critical regions and per Brinch Hansen, uh, there is a condition C. Uh, only when that condition C is true, the condition C is expressed in terms of values of certain shared mutable variables. Only when that condition is true do you enter S and execute S. But the testing of that condition and the execution of S happen in one step. As I said, this is our sort of uh, least uh, robust uh, concept in X10, and we eventually ended up uh, not using these guys a whole lot. We had to fall back on latches and locks and lower level notions in order to get the performance that we wanted. So this was, uh, I have not followed the work in this in the last five or 10 years. So I don't know if there are better ideas around, but at this point, we, we tried, we had uh, David Cunningham had a PhD around ownership types and how to use you know, static uh, type information to do a better job of allocating locks. Uh, but, you know, then nothing works in a general way. So we ended, did not end up implementing anything uh, interesting there. Okay, um, so the idioms. Now you can see how the kinds of idioms I've talked about earlier can be written in this style. So remote evaluation is, you know, obvious. We discussed this already. Uh, there is an uh, idea of something called active messages that came out of Berkeley in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, where you are sending a message off to the other side somewhere to go execute stuff there. So as soon as you put an async in the, as the top level body of an at, you're basically saying that the next statement after that at can execute immediately once this message has been sent off to the remote side. Because there's nothing to wait for. So that is the idiom in X10 for expressing an active message. Uh, SPMD, um, uh, this is an SPMD without barriers. So it's a simple kind of an SPMD. Uh, you, uh, within a finish, you uh, run a for loop. Of course, uh, we reify the notion of a place within the programming language. There's a runtime library that gives you place objects. Uh, and uh, uh, it, in fact, gives you a handle on all the place objects. So that's what uh, place.places does. And by the way, you know, uh, when we, as I say, when we designed X10, we didn't have the notion of resilience in mind. This is a big problem if you're working in a resilient context. There's no notion of the global set of places. Something may die as soon as you go look for it. So this sort of a thing is what you need to use the computer science technique of one level of indirection to handle if you're going to have places that are going to fail. In any case, I'm giving you the simple version. So this says, on all the places that are in my system, so when you start your computation, you specify in X10 today when you will run computations, you will specify the number of places that you're going to run on. So this will iterate over all of those places and then you go to each of those places and you run asynchronously some code there. The out of finish makes sure that they all come back together. You wait until they're all finished, and then you go execute. As I said, there's no barrier here. To introduce barriers, we introduced another. To support barriers nicely, we introduced another idea called clocks. Uh, 
And uh, tomorrow when I discuss uh, the, some of the research directions that we uh, took in X10, I will uh, mention clocks in passing. Clocks give us a nice um, uh, lexically scoped way of dealing with barriers while preserving the fundamental sort of X10 uh, idea of trying to keep things as dynamic as possible. So that was that. Uh, an atomic remote update, uh, while that's easy, uh, you go to that place and you asynchronously, uh, you send off a message. So this is like an active message, but the active message is going to atomically update a location using a value V that came in from the context in which at ref was being executed. So that value is being passed through for execution on the remote side. So that's what an atomic uh, update looks like. You want to swap, so this is a little bit more interesting. You want to do a data exchange, swapping the local and remote. Uh, so here is what you do. You go to the, uh, you go uh, do a finish, go to the remote place at R uh, asynchronously. There you get the value of, uh, and the value of that remote thing r in a local variable, underscore r, you update it with the value of your local variable that you had obtained before you went into this. And then you come piece of code. You come back to your original location and you update this very L. Now this better be a global reference. So when you do this round trip, you're still referring to the very same object. You come back here and you update it with the value that you read uh, before you assign. So just like what you would do if you were doing a swap on a single uh, thread between two locations, just like that, except that you have to inter you have to throw in ats and asyncs and finishes in the right way to ensure that you get the atomicity that you are after. Of course, this is not atomic with respect to other things that might be going on. Uh, they might be updating, so uh, I don't have an up atomic here. So there are other updates going on to R and L, they will happen interspersed with all this. If you want that guarantee, then you've got to put in an atomic, but that atomic can only happen here. You can't put an atomic around the entire finish because of the restrictions that I gave you earlier. Any questions on this? This is sort of the basic programming model for AP gas. Yes. Um, because there is nothing waiting on that side for this to return. There is no code here. Okay. If you didn't do that, and the naive runtime would need to send a message of completion back. But there's nothing waiting for it. So why bother? Any other question? Okay, so uh, let's go on. Uh, so I guess at some level I should say right here that one of the achievements I'm proudest of for the X10 team, uh, what we did, and again, Olivier Tardu did the major work on this, was we made this work for 50,000 places on the big P7 supercomputer that came from uh, IBM uh, many years ago, I guess 2000. 13, 14, around then. We showed DARPA, this was our sort of final exam. We showed them a bunch of benchmarks, um, uh, the usual SPMD benchmark and some new benchmarks that we designed. We showed them operating at scale using these idioms, uh, uh, which effectively boiled down to showing that we could actually implement a runtime that worked with simple things like this, but still gave you uh, performance. The sequential language. Uh, this I'm going to gloss over. This is essentially vanilla. Uh, it's Java, as I said, but with a Scala syntax. And some people have told me, you got it exactly the wrong way around. Uh, that's OK. Uh, um, uh, uh, Java programming model, Scala syntax. They wanted a Scala programming model and a Java syntax. Um, so you get classes and interfaces. You get single inheritance, uh, multiple uh, interfaces, the usual Java style, and by the way, uh, we are not reusing the Java compiler. Uh, we have written our own compiler that implements all of these things, in particular because we needed to implement them on the C++ toolchain, as I mentioned before. Uh, 
um, and we had new things that were not Java specific, not uh, Java compatible, like uh, 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 like uh, constraint types and generic types. Uh, we have uh, virtual dispatch, like normal self-respecting object-oriented languages, overriding, overloading static methods, packages, files, uh, you know, garbage collection. Uh, so there's automatic garbage collection going on uh, within a single place. We actually had a paper on an implementation of a global garbage collector. So of course it is possible to get cycles across multiple places uh, which are all not reachable. So you got garbage globally. So we did, Kavachia um, uh, had a paper on, and I don't remember the details now, but we did implement, at least for managed extent, a global uh, uh, reference counting garbage collector. Um, turns out that the Java, and this is, I'm going to have to gloss over this very quickly, unfortunately, uh, the Java, um, programming model, particularly with respect to object initialization, is very tricky. And the reason it is tricky is because Java allows references to this object that is being created. It's not really an object yet, this proto-object, to be leaked. And other threads have access to it. And then they can go do things on it. This is a nightmare if you want to have any kind of reasonable guarantees about the behavior of your code in a parallel, con in a concurrent context. So we took that problem on, and we said, we're not going to have this. So we did a paper in uh, Oopsla or Ecoop, uh, uh, 2010 or so, this was with Yoav Zibin, where we did so-called hard hat initialization. So our, uh, our rules, language rules for uh, what can be done to an object that is being created, so what can be done inside a constructor are much stricter than Java's rules. And the guarantee is that you will, as a result of our stricter initialization rules, you will never be in a position that one of these half-formed objects can leak out to some other, uh, to some other thread. Um, um, so we have the usual notion of variables and values. We went off and we did something interesting. We also uh, developed something called value types or structs. We eventually call them structs in X10. So this was another long language debate and we went through a few rounds of that debate around what are value types really. The intuition is clear, a value type should have no mutable state inside. And you should be able to simply copy those values and, move, and particularly as you saw with an at, there's a lot of copying going around. So you should be able to copy freely these things. So you want a principled way of distinguishing when you can copy freely and when you've got to preserve the notion that there is a mutable uh, location inside it. So eventually we came up with structs that look very much like C-level structs. Um, uh, and then there's also this notion that you want to be able to point into the middle of a struct. So uh, let me put it like this. Um, uh, arrays are really critical and arrays of floats are really important. Uh, in uh, Java, you face this problem that uh, um, if you create an array, and uh, if you create an array of, uh, uh, of long or uh, int objects, then you're paying excessive overhead. Each location in that array is actually a pointer to the place where the data is stored rather than being the data itself in line. So structs are extends answer to, oh, Java only has eight built-in types. So structs correspond to built-in types in Java, but the programmer has the ability to define these built-in types. For example, the canonical example in the case of HPC is you want to define a complex type. It has a real and an imaginary part. Both are doubles or whatever, and uh, you know, there should be no reason why you can't define it. In Java, you can't. In order to define this, you've got to define a class, and a class will have this overhead problem that I talked about. So, so, we, had, uh, so we went through that whole design, and we've got structs implemented in, uh, in X10. The control constructs are the usual R, and here's a very important point. Uh, this turns out to be critical uh, when we do resilience, and that is we kept exceptions. So uh, just uh, as so we realized that exception model of the non-resumptive exceptions that Java had are actually quite powerful and quite interesting. So it turns out that in fact, in resilient extent, when a place crashes, I can sort of give you a quick preview, uh, what happens if you're running code here and a place crashes? Well, 
Let's assume this is not place zero, a small assumption. It's not place zero, the only way that any code could get here and be executing is through an at. That's how I designed the language. You can't do anything else otherwise. So there is an execution of an at statement that is live when this place went down. So it's obvious what to do, the at must throw an exception. Just like it's an asynchronous exception, just as happens in the case of JVM, you run out of a garbage, you run out of memory, you get a garbage collection error, uh, exception thrown asynchronously. So we build on the exception mechanism of the underlying sequential language to carry information about what happens when you run out of underlying physical resources that are critical for execution, in this case, the place managed. Okay. And so this, foresight, if you would call it, of keeping exceptions in the language paid off handsomely when we went to a resilient extent, where in reality we had to do nothing else than this. Recognize that we can throw exceptions and recognize we have already built our language model in such a way there's an arm's length relationship between mutable code data here and mutable data here. You've got to execute something to get there. And so that is the place where you say you can break if that place, remote place goes away. Okay, so, and then we did comprehension loops and iterators. I'm just going to skip over all that. Uh, the syntax, uh, this, uh, you will start to see code uh, tomorrow, which will make all this very clear. Uh, the x colon int, I mentioned this before. The declarations are with val, var, and def. Uh, we have function literals, you need them. And since then, Java has function literals too. Um, and they are uh, things like this. Uh, as far as possible, we obviously use a functional style for all our APIs. So, you know, if you've got reducers and scanners and all those sorts of things as well uh, on top of mutable state. And uh, then uh, types are, uh, um, so uh, there is local type inference. You don't have to declare the type. Uh, if that um, is, uh, you know, inferred for you. Um, we've got structs, I mentioned them, headerless inline objects. Uh, there are type defs because our types become pretty, um, like in any statically typed language, they can become uh, uh, pretty cumbersome to type in. So we have type defs for that. Um, and uh, uh, we have reified generics, which are not templates in the sense that the types are made explicit. Let me see if I have any examples of constraint types. I don't. Here is your hello world. Um, there is just like Java, uh, there's a top level package. There is, uh, you know, you import for your IO, you import a console uh, class, you define um, a class here, hello. Uh, you've got a main method, it's a static main method. It takes, we distinguish rails from arrays. Java does not have any support for multidimensional arrays. You know, it's only got these uh, nested arrays. And, multi, and uh, flexible multidimensional arrays are a staple for HPC. So we distinguish two different abstractions, a rail, which corresponds to Java style arrays, you know, single dimensional, uh, zero to n minus one, and then a more complex uh, uh, multidimensional arrays where the index sets can vary in much more complicated ways. Uh, and uh, then we have distributed arrays where made up of arrays in each of these places. So this is what the code looks like. You print out hello world, uh, you create uh, a new uh, hello object, which is something like this. You call a test method on it, you'll get back some result, and then you print that out. So this looks very much sequential piece of code, just like Java with slightly different syntax. Um, uh, you'd compile that on a C++ backend, like so. Uh, this, creates, uh, um, uh, this creates an executable hello that you can then execute. Uh, on a Java backend, you get a class file, and then instead of uh, running with Java as the command line argument for in invoking a JVM, you run it with X10, which internally invokes the JVM and uh, supplies it with this class. There are a whole bunch of compiler flags that you can provide, which for uh, we support uh, generation of optimized code, no checks. There are lots of runtime checks for uh, bounds and things like this. And critically, you get to specify how many places you're going to run your computation on. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think I've mentioned this. Uh, there are uh, 
uh, structs are the generalization in X10 of primitive types. Uh, there are the usual primitive types that are all implemented as structs. In addition, you can implement your own uh, a struct like a complex in this way. And in fact, we allow some uh, inline definitions as well. So X10 also has a fairly sophisticated notion of annotations on uh, these kinds of constructs. So at inline is an annotation. There are many other annotations as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is critical that a rail of complex N has the same layout as a rail of double of twice that with allocation happening in successive uh, memory locations. That's handled by the compiler in the runtime. Okay, I will actually stop here and we'll talk about arrays uh, tomorrow. Any questions today? Okay, I am going to be around. I think we have uh, another session now for a hands-on tutorial or something. So I'll be around for that. So if you have questions, then we can also take them up. Then. Please. A sli slightly more global question. What sort of uses uh, do, you, do you do? Of course, of course. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, so that's uh, another advantage, if you would call it, of so, you know, the US uh, uh, entrepreneurial world is an amazing world. Uh, we've had uh, Bell Labs, that, and we've had Xerox PARC, uh, AT&T Research, IBM Research, places which have stayed for a very long time. And what they offer is a context in which a project like the Extend project can be executed over a very significant period of time. Uh, I have now spent 30 years in corporate research labs, and um, besides Extend, I've not had any other project last as long. Right? It's a 10 plus year project. Now, of course, we had DARPA funding for a lot of it, but still. The other big advantage of working in a corporate research lab is you get local uses. So I spent, uh, I was chief scientist for a product in IBM, primarily because we took X10 and said it was a distributed in uh, cache memory uh, with a rule system running inside it. Uh, um, and we said, we're going to run it on top of X10. So we made that work. So there was a release of the product uh, with uh, using the extend runtime to uh, the managed runtime, not the native runtime. This is why we had to stick with both a managed and a native, because there was never any hope that our business units would use the native version other than the HPC world. So we had some production releases of the, na of the managed extend in products from IBM. And uh, we've had um, uh, a number of libraries and uh, uh, systems developed in the HPC world using this stuff, but nowhere near the success of Scala or the success of, uh, I would say, now I spend a lot of my, all my time in natural language understanding and in machine learning, and I'm really sorry to say Python kills everything. So, you know, all of this fancy work we do in programming language design, a language like Python has actually won the day. So, uh, uh, so we use Python extensively, but don't use X10 at Goldman Sachs uh, for our work. So, you know, that's the downside. But the uh, flip side is, the other side is, there are a lot of PhD theses done on X10. So there's a work going on in a number of different research uh, universities building on top of the X10 programming model. And then some of our colleagues in uh, Japan did um, a graph library on top of X10, which actually has some pretty good numbers. Uh, I think uh, there are references to this on uh, the web page, uh, that graph library. Uh, and it does much better than some of the other graph libraries that are out there that work on large graphs at scale. So that is the place where I see future work going in X10 is to develop uh, for quote, big data, more consumable, not at the level of a programming language, but at the level of libraries for specific sorts of uses. I actually also did uh, a deep learning implementation, an asynchronous stochastic gradient descent implementation a few years ago in X10. And that worked out really beautifully. It was another couple of hundred lines of code. And you get what uh, the Google guys did with uh, dist belief. So uh, that is, so I'm not, uh, so I'm probably going to come back when we do more large scale computation uh, in the context of machine learning, going to come back to using X10 in that context. All right, more questions? Thank you so much. Uh, see you guys soon for the next session and then tomorrow.